Mr. Vogler indicated that he didn't feel he needed a permit. And uh, our chief ranger said that, in fact, under the current regulations that, that we have, that Mr. Vogler did need a permit and asked him if he intended to get one. And he said he did not intend to get one. Wait a minute, that's what King George tried a little over 200 years ago when it caused some problems back in the 13 colonies and you know what happened to England. Well, I predict the same thing's gonna happen here because you're gonna have to get a permit to do everything. Well, uh, maybe they can jam it down this younger generation's throat, get them in the habit of getting a permit, but I'll tell you what, I'm too old to start that. I was not born to be a permittee. Winter is a quiet time in Alaska's northern interior, but while this frozen land slumbers, a war is raging, and the battle lines are drawn along thousands of miles of Alaska's historic trails. On July 14, 1984, a D-8 Caterpillar and transporter driven by Joe Vogler were stopped by National Park Superintendent Dave Mahalik along the Bielenberg Mining Trail, just a few hundred yards from Weber Creek. The Bielenberg Trail winds through the center of the Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve to Vogler's mining claim. Superintendent Mihalik reacted swiftly. We went to the U.S. District Court judge in Anchorage and uh, explained to the, to the judge that we felt that certain damage would occur if uh, Mr. Vogler and his equipment were allowed to continue on into the preserve. Mr. Vogler's instance, we wouldn't have had any problem at all had he wanted to use it at this time of year, for example, when we're out here now. As you know, the ground is hard, it's frozen. There's certainly adequate snow cover. There's probably, oh, 14 to 16 inches of snow on the ground. And so that snow protects the surface of the ground. In this particular instance, we feel that the use should take place during the winter time, not during the middle of July. So we did come in by helicopter, and we landed, and we asked Mr. Vogler to, to stop and not continue forward until we could get the question resolved in court. Mr. Vogler did do that. One of the things that you can see from the cat over here is that being off the trail like it is, you're creating another trail. And when you create two trails, you end up with just double your problem. The biggest problem is it's an unrestricted use of the land, which Congress has said we can, we can make such a use, but we still have to protect the resources. And that's, I think, what the National Park Service is trying to do is to accommodate folks like Mr. Vogler other miners in the preserve who wish to mine and continue to mine to accommodate them, but to at least protect the land for those other people in the re throughout the rest of the United States, not just Alaska, who are really expecting us to protect this land. Now, large pieces of equipment like this obviously cannot tra you know, go over this ground uh, when, when the ground is soft without doing some sort of damage. So consequently, what ordinarily happens is these types of trails are used during the winter. This has always been known as a winter trail. It has been used in the summertime on a few occasions, but for the most part, it has been used only during the winter. What happened was this particular vehicle, what you have to look at are these tires here. Now this, this equipment, this transporter, I'm six foot three, and I'm standing on a couple of inches of snow, but these tires are 43 inches wide. Now those tires are, are designed to go over soft ground. I mean, they are not tires that you would normally use on the road. These particular wheels dug fairly deep ruts, 18, 20 inches. Now, what can happen in a, in a situation like that is that a continued pass, if it's 18 inches this time, it just thaws down deeper. It exposes more permafrost to the, to the air, which causes more soil to, to thaw. And so the next time a vehicle comes across, 
it's and it's unfrozen it's not on frozen ground it can just sink down even more now in fact what can happen is is if you take a vehicle like this it can only go on that type of ground maybe once or twice then it has to go beside the trail and you create a wider trail there are parts of of different trails that I've seen in, in other parts of Alaska where the trails are not just one or two or three trails wide, but are 15, 16, 17, 18 trails wide. And so in that particular instance, where is the trail? It was questions like these that concerned Superintendent Mihalik as he planned to stop Joe Vogler. Where I first, first observed Mr. Vogler was uh, just coming in into this area here, Thanksgiving Creek being here and, and uh, the preserve boundary running north and south just along in here. And he was about three miles away from the preserve boundary. At that point, what he was doing was he was getting ready to cross one of these smaller creeks and then came up over and uh, was just at about this point on Weber Creek and was perhaps a quarter mile away from crossing Weber Creek. From Weber Creek, he would have gotten up onto this high ridge. And this ridge goes along, and just off the map here is, is the woodchopper mine right here. So, so really, we're only talking about eight miles. Uh, once he'd gained that ridge, it would have been a moot point. He would have already been into the mine. Hey, I've got it right. That's a public highway. I don't have to get a permit to go out here on the public highway. You can be going down to rob a bank and you've got a right to use that road. Well, why should anybody have a permit to travel? Who do they think they are? Is this what's coming in America? It's already been predicted you'll have to have a permit to travel from state to state. Are they, are they going to do that in Alaska first? How much guts have they got? You know, I am really questioning where America's intended goal is because everything I see is contrary to what it was. So I'm not going to be able to show you very much except a, a country that uh, we should have the right to, to go about in. It's been that way since we've come up here. We've been able to move about freely and, and uh, stake claims and uh, cut timber and uh, camp and fish and hunt. And uh, If a park service is maintaining a park for the benefit of the public, they shouldn't be worrying about a few tracks out across the muskeg. They're the evidence of man's time here, uh, of his activities here. He was close. We figure probably a around eight miles. <laughs> you know, if they'd have just given us another, what would it take us? 10 minutes to be across the creek, and we'd have been up on the hill and long gone. Joe Vogler's cat. Well, uh, I hope, uh, I hope we aren't looking at that 100 years from now and marveling over it and saying, gosh, it's still there. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It'll either move out of here without any permits, without any red tape, or it'll set here and rust into the ground. That's what part of the litigation is about, is does Mr. Vogler, in fact, need a permit? And, uh, and I don't know whether I can really speak to that issue. Um, is that a highway? I don't know. I, uh, I don't think it is. I think that a, a track across, across the ground uh, is not something like the Steez Highway, and certainly you don't have to have a permit on the Steez. Well, you know, uh, in 1866, the American Congress passed an act, and in Section 8 of that, it says the right of way to construct a public highway across a public land which is not reserved for public use is hereby granted. And that, that's the law that uh, justified the use of the pioneers that moved west across the plains, and it's the law that justified the early miners to build trails that are now the Steese Highway and the Elliott Highway and the Richardson Highway. You know, if, if Mr. Vogler came in here this morning and he asked me for a permit, he could be driving that cat to his mine this afternoon. They can go straight to hell, and hell will be frozen over solid before I'll do that. There's no compromise. You, you, the moment you start compromising, well, they're just going to keep backing you up. They get their foot in the doors like an elephant, and pretty soon the elephant's in and you're out. No way. I got a little bit rough with him because uh, I said, Mr. Mahaley. Now, I said, I want to know the son of a bitch that's giving me the trouble. I want to meet him. 
He said, you will. Well, I haven't met him yet, but when I do, you can bet a dollar that's the way I'm going to express him. Hello, Mr. So-and-so. The order to stop Joe Vogler came from the office of this man, Roger Conter, Regional Director for the National Park Service. As a young man in the 1940s, Roger Conter mined for gold himself on the old dredge at Chattanooga, 30 miles north of Fairbanks. Well, there's, no, there's no argument that uh, there was a lot of strong feelings against the creation of the new national parks. You could say in one sense that society wasn't really ready for the new national parks of Alaska. But no one had a choice. The discovery of oil in Prudhoe Bay precipitated a process that uh, no one could stop and no one could ignore. Uh, it's easier to have a national park created when there's enough people in the area that want one to support it. But in this case, we, you know, society and Congress couldn't wait until uh, Alaska was settled to the point that they saw vestiges of its beauty being changed and disappearing and, uh, and hungered for something to be preserved. In this case, we got the preservation far ahead of the need curve. Alaska didn't need the national parks in 1980. It's going to someday. I don't know what the answers are. I think we lost the golden opportunity of working out something that I think would have been novel in the nations. We could have then established floating transportation corridors that uh, uh, the cooperative management plan using state, federal, and local interests as the uh, entity that would say, in essence, look, if you're going to build a road into this particular ecosystem, this is agreed to be the best place to do it. Now we're prevented from doing that because they established the park boundaries, and we don't build roads in parks. We've established, and uh, we don't permit certain hunting activities in parks, and a lot of people are closed off. I think it would have gone a long way to mitigate some of those problems and concerns. The interesting thing was, I presented that to virtually every member of Congress at the time the D2 issue was under discussion. It's the one issue on which our entire congressional delegation, Mike Gravel and Ted Stevens both, and Don Young, agreed the cooperative management concept was an appropriate approach. Many congressmen, including Mo Udall and Cyberling, said, hey, that's an intriguing idea and it seems to make sense, but can you sell it to the environmentalists? Unfortunately, most environmentalists, with rare exception, did not like the idea because they saw the opportunity of carving out 100% protected enclaves under park systems. And my argument to them was, isn't it better to broaden that protection all over that entire ecosystem rather than having, again, 100% protection here and then virtually nothing adjacent to it? But they were fearful that they would lose what they appeared to to them a certain victory regarding the establishment of parks and refuge in many areas. The Northern Alaska Environmental Center saw the issue from a different perspective. I don't buy that argument of we're locking up our land. I mean, this is, it, it didn't belong to just Alaskans. It belongs to all the people of this nation. And there's a great many Alaskans, an increasing number, that care more about that wild characteristics of the land, the wildlife on it, than they do about getting a couple ounces of gold out of it. And you're going to be seeing more and more as time proceeds, you're going to be seeing Alaskans start to stand up for those values. They're not going to put up with this um, spending all kinds of state dollars and this kind of thing to, to benefit just a few miners out there. Roger Burgraff arrived in the territory of Alaska in 1952. He tried his hand at several occupations before turning to gold mining in the Fairbanks area. Today, he is president of the Fairbanks chapter of the Alaska Miners Association. The mining industry is very important. Of course, Alaska is a resource state. Um, that's, we, we are a treasure house of, of resources which uh, can uh, help uh, the balance of payments and and do a lot to to help the economy of the of the nation mining it's been the livelihood of many people and a lot of times when people think of mining I mean of Alaska they think of, of mining and uh, to destroy you know the industry you're destroying a way of life you know a traditional 
uh, means of gain, making a livelihood, you're restricting, you know, the opportunity for the individual to go out and and make something uh, of himself and 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 produce. We've all been concerned with the attitude of the National Park Service with respect to access. Uh, it seems uh, where the major conflict is here is that uh, for many years uh, miners and other and trappers and other people have used uh, trails and, and old roads to gain access you know to their properties um, with uh, Anilka and uh, the setting up of these special uh, management areas all of a sudden a lot of people found uh, that they were right in the middle of a park and were subject to uh, rules and regulations which they had never had to comply with before. It would be tough to be a miner uh, in Alaska today as compared with uh, the freedom that they had 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I can identify with that. My father was a miner in Alaska in the 1930s and the 1940s. I myself for a while was a miner in Alaska, but I didn't survive uh, as a miner. Uh, it, it, I think it just is a, a pattern of history that the amount of freedom anyone can have in any endeavor is generally, generally reduced uh, proportionate to the number of people they have to share their, the resource with. Okay. As time goes on, just as happened in the lower 48 miners, the first miners of the lower 48 had a lot of freedom. They don't have that anymore, and uh, the conflicts that they are running into in today's society will probably be increased as, as uh, we go forward into, into history. Uh, we will continue to work. We'll, we'll uh, fight them in the courts if it's necessary. Uh, we're going to, you know, this is a life or death situation for us. Um, our, our livelihoods, our, our our uh, families uh, are, are at stake, and uh, we'll do everything within our power to, to try to continue uh, to mine. These were tough, resourceful people, and they're still tough and resourceful. Uh, so we're, we're a little bit ambivalent in one sense. We, uh, we cherish the mining scene and want to share that with the visiting public. At the same time, we have to provide this, uh, this magical um, uh, term reasonable regulations so that the mining can take place without any undue or unnecessary damage to the other resources and to, uh, to other people's needs. Ed Gelvin lives in the historic mining town of central Alaska. Typical of most miners, he spends the long, dark winter months preparing for the short but intense summer mining season. He rebuilds caterpillar equipment, fixes airplanes, runs a trap line, and keeps a homestead. Gelvin has driven cats and other heavy equipment over many of the old trails in the Circle Mining District. No, they're not protecting anything. That trail's been gone over with all kind of equipment for years and years, and it should, it should be protected all right. It should be protected from the Park Service. <laughs> I understand that they can't deny you access, but uh, in the case of the Park Service over there, they could, they could make it uh, so rough for someone like Joe if he had to get a permit uh, every time he wanted to move to, that it would, it would really be hard to operate a place like that. This appeared to us to be very unreasonable. Uh, it was a winter trail being used in the summer. It was a trail that could be used on frozen ground and on snow with relatively little damage to the 
to the vegetation and to the soil underneath the vegetation. I don't think they care any more about the uh, environment or the land out there than I do. Uh, it might be that someday this will be a road, but it will be a road only after all of the environmental um, requirements have been met and the decision-making process clearly indicates that there is no reasonable alternative. Certainly, we had uh, no discretion in what we did with Mr. Vogler. Joe Vogler sees it differently. His exhaustive research has convinced him that neither Roger Conter nor the Park Service has any authority over his use of the Bielenberg Trail. In his defense, Vogler cites the Federal Highways Act of 1866, commonly called Revised Statute, or RS-2477. This statute granted rights of way for highways over unreserved public lands. According to state law, even a backcountry trail may fall within the definition of a highway. Although RS 2477 was repealed in 1976, the highway rights of way already established under the law may still be valid. What makes this potentially a major test case revolves around the use that Vogler and others made of this trail and whether their use was sufficient to qualify it for status as a highway under federal law. If Vogler is right, it could be argued that hundreds of other trails qualify as highways, even if they now cross national parks, native land holdings, or private property. The entire problem is whether it has been used for sufficient time and uh, to, to prove that it has been accepted by the highway. One use I don't think would probably be sufficient in Alaska, although it's been held that way in, in other states. But uh, the, the trail in question here has been used for many, many years. It was a trail back in, in the 30s. I have evidence, a man's affidavit to that effect, and I don't see any possibility but what this has been used long enough so that it constituted an acceptance by the, by the state and territory of Alaska. Joe Vogler's affidavit came from here, Palm Springs, California, as unlikely a residence as you can imagine for an Alaskan placer miner. But then Walter Roman is no ordinary miner, for it was his use of the Bielenberg Trail in the 1930s and 40s that forms a key element in Joe Vogler's defense. The land on which Vogler's D8 CAD now sits was in the 1930s unreserved public land within the meaning of the Federal Highways Act of 1866. Oh, uh, it was established long before for that. Uh, it was. Uh, you see, in the certain times of the fall, before the winter mail started in, the river was freezing up. And the government uh, cut these here trails so the, the mail carriers could uh, carry the mail over them. And uh, that's why the trail was cut. That must have been uh, about 1900, something like that there. I started on the mail run in about 34, and I carried it till 40, till 1940. Oh, they started uh, in 35 or 36 to using cats. The Olson brothers, they brought in some cats. Oh, Dean Patty and a bunch of them, they uh, started mining on Coal Creek and Woodchopper. And uh, they needed some freight, and they hauled it up over that there trail one winter. There'd been cats up over this year trail from old Woodchopper and Coal Creek and all the way to Eagle. There's been a cats up and down the foothills there. That's between the river and the, foot, the mountains. The government has kind of reversed its opinion of a lot of things. You know, in the early days, they helped the the uh, the prospectors and miners and settlers uh, explore the West. They helped them. They fought off the Indians for them and a lot of things. Now then, uh, whenever we start out in the hills in Alaska, it's just the opposite way around. We got to get a at least a dozen permits, you know, to even get out of town. 
Living just north of Fairbanks, Celia Hunter is the former director of the Wilderness Society. She has been an environmental advocate throughout the Alaska lands battles of the past two decades. I've known miners ever since I came up here, and I have a lot of respect for a lot of them. They're, they are hardworking, and they're very ingenious, and, and uh, the only problem is that we've run into a situation where they're being allowed to do their thing is depriving other people of the opportunity to do what they want to do. And we all need to use the same areas, and we can't do it if one person just totally wipes it out for the use of everybody else. And that's where the fight comes in. What we've said here in this particular instance is that it doesn't matter who the individual is, we do intend to manage these lands and we do intend to protect them. At the same time, we do, allow, we do intend to allow valid existing rights to continue. It's much easier for me to tell you what I think should have been done rather than where we go from here. I remember when I first came up here, of course, there were enormous freedoms to do all sorts of things. It was absolutely wonderful. You could go out and put up a cabin wherever you wanted, homestead a piece of ground, get a limited, or you didn't need a limited entry permit, go fishing if you wanted to, get an air, airplane to start flying commercially. And those doors were all being closed. And it's lamentable, on the other hand, if you kept them open, I don't know where in the world we'd be insofar as uh, retaining some of these values that attracted many of the people of Alaska to begin with. The state of Alaska and the Federal Bureau of Land Management recently signed a memorandum. Their objective, to identify RS-2477 trails. But the BLM now refuses to put the Bielenberg Trail on its maps, and the Park Service is not a party to the memorandum. They can go to hell. I don't know what the word compromise is because I'm right, they're wrong, and uh, they certainly violated our civil rights. We were not arrested. We were just served a temporary restraining order, strictly a civil action, by six armed men. The officer in town or the, or the state trooper is also armed. That's part of their job. That's all we were doing. It was part of our job to be armed. There's going to be one hell of a fight in the courts if they think they're going to discriminate me against me and keep me from going out there whenever I feel that I can do it in safety to my health and my condition. If you do not have mobility in a land, what can the common man do? Is it all going to be done by the government or by big companies under lease? What happened is this particular area, the, where we're standing right now, was set aside as a national preserve. That, that decision has been made. If I'm wrong in my belief that the federal government cannot retain sovereignty here, my bones won't rot under the American flag, I'll tell you. I'm going to Whitehorse, I'm going to buy a burial plot. And if I do not win this lawsuit, lock, stock, and barrel, if I'm wrong in my concept of what America meant when it started out, I don't want to lie under their flag. And the battle will be fought in Washington, D.C. The biggest problem is it's an unrestricted use of the land. I go down one of them old trails from Fish Creek to Bear Creek, and uh, I never have got a permit for that either. Highway planning needs to be based on something besides the fact that somebody went that way one time. Well, I'm going to take it right to the bitter end. This equipment will set right here. I hope, uh, I hope we aren't looking at that 100 years from now and marveling over it and saying, gosh, it's still there. 